Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Frazier. I'm the Chief of Community Services here at the Department of Development, joined by uh, some other folks from Community Services, Megan Meadows, our Assistant Chief, Annie Van Blaircom, and Greg Payne, and then Tiffany Starr, who you may see at the top, is uh, helping us work through the uh, presentation. So we're excited to have you all here. I know a lot of you that I'm sure are listening in are excited to have this event occur. I know that there's been a lot of interest and a lot of excitement around the state ever since the state budget bill passed, creating uh, the brownfield and demolition um, remediation and revitalization programs. Development was very excited to for this opportunity to be able to to work on these of these programs. We've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. I've talked to a lot of folks that I'm sure are participating throughout the process as as we work through uh, crafting the guidelines posted up the guidelines here the other day on development's website and wanted to schedule this webinar just to kind of walk through those. Um, maybe we'll walk through the, the question part as, as you guys have questions, you're able to ask them. We do have this scheduled for an hour presentation. Um, one of the recent programs we did was the water and wastewater program as well. Um, that did go beyond an hour, so there is the opportunity where your question's not addressed or we have to uh, end the webinar um, at the allotted time at 2.30 that you can still reach out to us, inquire with your questions and, and things like that. So, you know, with that, I'll turn it over to Megan, but thank you for joining us. We'll be here and um, like I said, we're just excited to get this program up and running. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, as Mike said, my name is Megan Meadows. I am the assistant chief here at the community services division, and we are excited today to talk about the brownfield and demolition programs and walk through um, just some highlights on the guidelines that are now available on our website. Um, just to you know, highlight a few things, provide opportunities for folks to ask some questions um, and you know, get some feedback from from entities as they begin this process. So first, just wanted to talk through the webinar structure today. Um, you will notice that you have a Q&A feature there at the bottom of your screen, um, and that will be your opportunity to ask questions, to type those questions into the question box. As Mike mentioned, we have uh, an hour available today. So after we walk through the slides, we will take an opportunity to kind of read through the questions that are post rest. Any questions that we can't answer today, or if we don't get through the whole list today, um, we will work on those and send those responses back out uh, to entities as we go. Um, so for uh, uh, just put your questions there in the box and we will uh, get to those at the end of today's presentation. We're also recording today's presentation um, and we'll make the recording and slides available on our website after today as well. So I wanted to first kick off today's discussion talking about the Brownfield Remediation Program. So guidelines were released on December 7th. If you visit development.ohio.gov slash brownfield, that is where the program information is available, um, including our uh, email address that you can send questions or comments to. So that's redevelopment at development.ohio.gov. Um, so the goal of this program was to um, provide funding to uh, assist in the remediation of hazardous or substance uh, materials at a commercial or industrial uh, property. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the previously administered Clean Ohio program that was administered through our office. So we took a lot of lessons learned from that program um, and built this program um, in, in adherence to the guidelines that were set forward within the statute. Wanted to talk through, um, excuse me, I missed a slide here. Wanted to talk through the funding that's available. So there's $350 million available. For those of you that read um, the uh, House Bill 110, there is a $1 million set aside for each county. That $1 million set aside is available for each county until June 30th of 2022. Um, so as listed in the guidelines, there are a certain uh, eligible applicants that can apply for funding through this program. So uh, the first set of eligible applicants includes any unit of local government. So that includes a county, a township, a municipal corporation, a port authority, a conservancy district, or a park district. So collectively, those are referred to as units of local government. A, a county land bank is also eligible to apply. A nonprofit organization or an organization for profit is also eligible to apply. Uh, as you'll see in the guidelines, and another um, point I wanted to note was that um, entities that caused or contributed to the contamination there on the brownfield site are not eligible to apply for the remediation funds for these programs. 
Um, eligible properties, they do need to meet that uh, ORC defined definition of a brownfield site um, and the contamination to be remedied uh, is required to be at the uh, subsurface level unless there's some contamination that um, needs to be remedied above that in order to gain access to that subsurface level. Um, Another thing that I did want to note is that, you know, if the property is eligible to go through the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency or the Ohio EPA's voluntary action program, um, that would be a goal of this program to, to utilize that, that resource um, with the ultimate goal of funding uh, to be able to achieve a covenant not to sue from the Ohio EPA. Um, so, you know, again, the ultimate goal is to have these sites cleaned up um, and remedied so that for uh, potential future use. I also want to note that um, a contrast to previously administered programs, there is not required to be a designated future end use for the properties that um, will be utilizing these funding streams. We do ask about that within the application. So if you have an end use identified um, and you have uh, you know, plans in place, that's great. We wanna know about what, what that is, but it is not technically a requirement of the program. Another thing that you will note in the application is that the funds are available for uh, cleanup or remediation, or they're available for assessment as well. So you can apply for um, a project that is either in that sort of assessment phase of the process or actually ready to do the, the cleanup and the remediation of the process. Okay, so um, again, I mentioned that there is a county set aside available for projects. So there is $1 million set aside of the nearly $350 million that are available statewide. Um, the maximum award that entities can apply for for cleanup projects is $10 million, and the maximum award for the assessment side of the projects is $300,000. Um, I would also note that there is a match requirement for projects um, that are outside of the $1 million county set aside. So once um, the $1 million county set aside has been uh, uh, completely obligated to, to the counties, then um, match kicks into play. So we can only um, pay up to 75% of the total project cost for projects. Um, the application process for the for the brownfield funds will be in three rounds. So the first round, we are going to open up that online application process next week, um, and then the application itself will close on January 31st of next year. Uh, the, the application process, again, is open to all eligible applicants to apply for an assessment or a cleanup. Um, and then once that January 31st, the application closed, we will take a look at the projects that are received. We uh, will be reviewing projects on a first come, first serve basis as the ORC requires. And we will take also a look at projects that um, do not have match fund committed to the project and try to utilize the county set aside for those projects since a match requirement is, is not required for that first $1 million set aside. Plan right now is to have a round two that will become available around March 1st of next year. So that round two will target specifically those counties that did not utilize the full $1 million that has been set aside through the legislation. So we will reach out to um, to those communities to see if there is an interest in applying for the additional resources that are available specifically for their counties. Um, and that was what will be the round two process. The round three will be if there's any additional funds available of the nearly 350 million and we will open back up the application process. Once we get to a round three in July 1st of 2022, there is no longer the requirement to have that county set aside of the $1 million. So anything that is remaining will be available um, and awarded on a first come first serve basis with the goal to close that application process by September of next year. Um, the, the guidelines I did want to point out that are available on their website provide uh, greater detail about what is an eligible cost, what is an ineligible cost, also what can be used for that match funding. Um, we do encourage entities, if you have match funding available, to go ahead and include that in your application, um, just in case that $1 million county set-aside gets utilized quickly, uh, your project will uh, 
have better standing if you have match funding available for your project since it will be required for any projects outside of that time frame. Um, I also wanted to talk through um, next the actual application process. So for any entity that did uh, submit a, a Clean Ohio application through our agency a few years back, um, you'll remember it was, it was a quite a large application process. This go around, we've made everything digital and moved the application online. So entities can complete an online application. There doesn't need to be any hard copies submitted to our agency. Um, so, but in order to start this process, you will need to have uh, create an Ohio ID account. Um, so for anyone that has submitted application to development for other competitive programs, you probably did have to create an Ohio ID account and you can use that same account that you've created previously. Um, but you will log into the Ohio ID platform, provide some basic information, and then that establishes your account. And then it will redirect you to this online application page once we open that online application next week. So steps as far as submitting the application, you'll need to provide your federal tax ID number uh, in order to uh, have the, the specific location of where you are going to be submitting your project. Provide that tax ID number. Uh, anytime you log back into the application, you can always save and come back later and submit at a later date if you need to. Um, and uh, you can always see the status of your application once you log back in as well. At this point, after you've submitted your federal tax ID number, you have an opportunity to select whether you are going to be submitting an application for an assessment project or a cleanup and remediation project. Uh, so you'll click that and then go to next. And then this is where you will actually put in all of the uh, meat of your application. So we want to know your organization, um, the uh, some project specific information, including the project history, um, some activities that you plan to do at the project and what's the overall outcome. We also specifically want to know uh, what county the uh, property is at and if it's bordering more than one county, what's the primary county for the uh, property address. And the next, we will be asking information about the project name, the former name of the project, um, the, the again, the county served, and then the proof of ownership or proof of access that uh, the entity applying has for the specific location. Uh, other details that we're going to ask for in the online application process include like a history of the project, um, previous uses of the project, the impact um, that this project will have, um, and then a construction time frame if that's applicable for what you are applying for. We will also want some information about any um, other regulatory programs that the property is currently under and any assessment information that you can provide, whether you've already completed a phase one or phase two, um, and what other information is available on the property uh, to date when you submit your application. The next part of the application process, we'll talk about your readiness to proceed. And then again, what sort of planned activities and any job creation, if that's applicable for your project. Also, we are looking at some, some dates of when you plan to be able to begin the actual remediation of the property. The next part of the application is where you will upload any files. Um, the system will let you know when you do go to submit that if there are any um, any information missing in the application process that you can go back and re-enter in. The budget information is where you are going to provide uh, what your ask is, as and I mentioned previously, it's $300,000 cap for assessment projects and $10 million cap for the cleanup and remediation projects. So you'll enter in your total dollar amount requested within the allowable cost lines that we have outlined in the budget. And then you will also provide information on any match dollars that you have available for, uh, for the project as well and within those allowable cost categories. The last part of the application process is where you will certify the, the information you're providing as, as accurate, um, provide your contact information and submit the application. Again, the system will know uh, if you have any information that was not provided or documentation that was not uploaded, um, and then they will, uh, you'll be, you will not be able to submit until that is satisfied within the system. I will note that once you do click submit, you should receive an automatic email um, letting you know that your application was successfully submitted. Um, and then once we get these applications in the system, we will review them for um, any inaccuracies or incomplete information. We will notify you and you will have a 10-day cure period to get back any of that information back to us uh, that may be missing within your application. 
Again, these applications uh, will be open till the end of January. We encourage folks to get your applications in um, as soon as possible and uh, include all the information that is requested in there. Again, the contact information is that redevelopment at development.ohio.gov. If you have questions as you're going through the uh, application process, we're happy to, to help you out along the way. So at this point, we are through what the high level overview of what we wanted to provide on the Brownfield program. Um, we will go ahead and do the same for the demolition program and walk through that process. And then at that point, we will go ahead and take some questions from the audience. Okay, so the building demolition, the site revitalization program. Again, we launched that program this week. Uh, same, the web, the program is available on our website, development.ohio.gov slash demolition. Same email address, just send us an email at redevelopment.ohio.gov. So this program has nearly 150 million available. Uh, there is also a county set aside for this program, but that county set aside is $500,000 per county, and that will be set aside again until um, June 30th of 2022. The difference with the demolition program uh, in contrast to the Brownfield program is that we will actually be uh, utilizing um, uh, county land reutilization corporations or county land banks to serve as the lead entity. And then for communities that don't have a county land bank, um, we will be working with the county commissioners to establish who you want to be serve as the lead entity for that community. Um, so in essence, we will only have you know 88 providers throughout the state of Ohio that are administering the demolition programs. Um, el eligible properties are any uh, commercial and residential building sites that are not considered Brownfield. Um, so those can include, um, you know, buildings that were used for retail, office, manufacturing, industrial, industrial warehouse, um, and in institutional or other non, uh, non residential or mixed use buildings are eligible for the Brownfield funds. Um, and uh, so the uh, redevelopment part of this process is, you know, at the discretion of the lead entity um, or the local gov governments, and that might be dependent on what is within their strategic plan or their community plans um, as far as what's the next, what's the end goal for these uh, properties. Okay, so um, again, the, the guidelines online that are available for the demolition program do outline in detail, you know, what are eligible costs, what are ineligible costs for the program. There, uh, there is administrative costs available to cover the program. There are some pre-demolition costs um, eligible, obviously demolition costs, and then there's some post-demolition costs that are required for the program within the uh, budget section. Um, I will note that for the demolition program, as for the Brownfield program, the uh, state prevailing wage as outlined in the ORC that is cited within the guidelines is required for both of those programs. Um, and as with the uh, Brownfield program, a match requirement is also for the demolition program. Again, that match requirement kicks in after that county set aside of the $500,000 has been utilized and obligated. And that's when projects are required to submit uh, a match uh, documentation with their application process. So for these lead entities that are looking to submit an application um, in the system, we have a, a user agreement form that will have a, each lead, lead entity go ahead and fill out. Um, we are working to get that form online, should be uh, on the website by the end of the day. Uh, it's a simple document for you to provide who you want access to the application and the system online. So you'll send us over that form. Um, we will get those users set up in the system, and then we will open the application process um, on or around December 21st or 22nd towards the end of the month. Uh, once it for those entities that do not have a county land bank that will be serving as the lead applicant, the county commissioners have some time to go ahead and determine who will serve as the lead applicant, can be the county commissioners themselves, um, and then submit to us that, that uh, user access form so that we can open up the application to those users as well. The application process is also an online application process. It actually will look very similar to the uh, Brownfield application and that, you know, we'll, we will set up access for those folks and then you will be able to log in, provide your uh, federal tax identification number um, and begin the process and provide us some information on, um, on the demolition project itself, including the, the properties and your um, 
timeline for when you uh, plan to begin the project um, and then provide us some information on if there's any anticipated usage at the end of the project and, and other uh, property information. Um, again, the, the outlining the application process for these entities that do not, the counties that do not have a land bank, um, they will just need to provide a, a letter of intent um, on who is going to be the lead entity. There's no specific requirements on what needs to be included in that letter. That's up to your discretion. So just let us know who will be serving as the lead entity and send that our way. And then also provide the user agreement form so that way we can get those users uh, set up in the system. Um, we will, uh, again, be opening up that application on or before December 22nd. I believe I mentioned that earlier. And then um, entities can lead entities can go ahead and go online and submit that application. Uh, we will be closing down the first round of application on February 28th is the goal. And then we will review those projects. Uh, again, there is that county set aside of the $500,000. So uh, that doesn't require match. So we will be looking at these applications um, and making sure that the county set aside is utilized and that there is funding available. If additional funds are still remaining after this first round of applications, applications, uh, development will notif notify the lead entities that they may submit for more projects for additional funding resources. Um, Mike, at this point, I have gone through the slides. Is there any information that you would like to add or uh, clarify or correct on your end? No, I think that's good. I mean, we will get into the questions here. I think I just wanted to start uh, with a uh, couple little high level things. I know Megan said at the beginning of it, uh, just seeing some, some questions pop in. We are going to make these uh, the slide presentation um, as well as eventually this recording that was done available to folks to be able to go back and reference and, and see. So that'll be um, at your disposal. And then as Megan also indicated, you know, we will plan to have that user agreement up on the website here by the end of the day. Um, if it's not on already. So that way folks can have that available. Um, with that, I think we'll just go into the questions. All right, and at this point, we're gonna have Greg and Annie from our team kind of help us read through the questions and, and keep it a little organized as we go through. So Greg, do you wanna kick off going through the questions? Sure, yeah, the first question that we received was on the demo side, we have a major housing shortage in Zanesville, is there any way to utilize these funds to rehab instead of demolition? Uh, no, the, the funding is set aside within the legislation to be used specifically for demolition purposes. There's like, it, it allows revitalization of those properties. So, you know, the work to, um, once, once things have been cleared out to, you know, get that site ready, but but for like a rehab type, like Megan said, it, it is demolition. Annie, you wanna tackle the next one for us? Thanks. Oh, Annie, I think you're muted, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I had <laughs> thought I unmuted it. So is additional assessment an eligible cost under the cleanup tract of the remediation program. Guidelines say assessment or cleanup. So if you have a property that needs both updated assessment or delineation, can you apply for both under a cleanup tract? You can definitely apply for the assessment. I would urge you to apply for the assessment first and then apply for cleanup later or afterwards if there's still funding available, but we will prioritize assessment first um, if it comes in versus granting both applications at once, because the assessment dictates what the cleanup will be. So that's where we will be funding the assessment side first over a dual application. Okay, uh, next question, uh, would funds under this program be eligible for a, asbestos abatement and then a Similar question was, are asbestos only projects eligible for funding? Yes, you, you, funds. 
Sorry, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Yes, and actually there, there are, I would urge folks to look at the guidelines because there are avenues for asbestos to cover in both demolition and the brownfield cleanup programs. Um, so as, asbestos, we understand the, the importance of that, the cleanup of that. Um, and so there are avenues for a, a asbestos abatement to be eligible for these programs. Next question for the county brownfield set aside if ODOD, ODOD were to receive say $3 million of applications for projects that have no match and are all located within a single county, how will ODOD decide which to fund? Are there selection criteria and or a scoring system? So the legislation requires that review that we review applications on a first come first serve basis. So that that is the the leading criteria for what we will look at for the uh, county set aside for projects that don't have match funding available. Yep, using that as our guidepost. Next question is: Are we required to have projects identified prior to obtaining an ID, which I'm assuming for the ID uh, to register? You, you don't have to, I mean, you can use the Ohio ID. Uh, a lot of folks I know already have an Ohio ID. So feel free to sign up for that to utilize that. Uh, it's just that that will be required to submit any applications or identify projects uh, when you're ready to do that. The next question, is it required that the county's median household income be less than the state's? If not, will this be weighed in considering the award? It's not required. Um, that, that is a piece of information we are gathering in the application process just to help uh, better understand the project as a whole in the area that is being served. But it's not required that your county have a uh, lesser than the statewide average median household income. Okay, uh, can demo funds be used to pay expenses in creating a land bank? No. So it looks like the next question is similar to the one above. Same question as regards to the unemployment rates. Is this a requirement? If not, will it be waived? Uh, same response. Uh, so the unemployment rate is uh, does not is not required to be less than the statewide um, average unemployment rate at the time of the application. Again, it's just information we are gathering to better understand the impact of the project as a whole. Okay, uh, what is an acceptable as proof of access for the requirement document? Any type of owner demonstration of ownership or you know court order. I'm I'm thinking of some things or you know some sort of just acknowledgement that either you have control or some sort of access to the property. Next question, can a consultant or engineer submit an application on behalf of an eligible entity in the portal? Yes, you mm -hmm. just have to have the information of the eligible entity and that is who our, our grant agreement will be with. Okay, it says in the list of documentation to be submitted, it includes a re remediation plan. What does this mean? If the property has a known non ACM Contamination is a remedial, remedial action plan that has been pre prepared by an environmental professional required at the time of the application. Um, I think that Mike, unless correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think we can uh, take a look at the guidelines and provide a more specific response to that question. Yeah. And, we'll and I would say just, happen. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that to provide a further update. I would say that. Kind of what we talked about previously with the median income and, and things like that, all of those things are like if applicable or if you have them, it's not a you have to have this for consideration for the program. Okay. 
So I would also just highlight that as well. Next question. If the property is eligible for the voluntary action program, must the funds be used to obtain a covenant not to sue or can the funds be used for additional uses? So if the property, so we have outlined in the guidelines for the Brownfield that if the property is eligible for to go through the VAT process, that the fund should be utilized for the covenant not to sue. Um, if you are utilizing match funding for that instead, you can um, include that in, in your budget uh, under match resources. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're covering the cost through another source, that would be fine. Next question for the demo program. The guidelines state that the program is for sites that are not brownfields. How is this to be determined for non residential properties? So, how that will work is, and that's actually part of the legislation that we actually took that from the, the legislation that was passed. Um, now, in our mind, you know, a brownfield has that contamination to it. So if there is a covenant not to sue on that property, in our mind, you know, it is would not be a brownfield because you've obtained that level of, of cleanup that is necessary for that. So if there is a covenant not to sue or something to that effect on a property, you can provide that as part of your upload documents to demonstrate that. But that's kind of where that that comes into play. And I would also just say, if you've got, if you know the historical use of the property and you know that there is not, um, you know, historically ha have been an opportunity for brownfield contamination on the property, uh, that would suffice as well. Next question. To clarify for the brownfield program, only 88 million is available until 630 2022 starting 7 1 2022 the remaining 262 million plus any of the 88 million not distributed will be available correct uh, no um, entities can go ahead and apply for uh, as as much funding as they would like right now um, the first round Will we will uh, try to award as much of the county set aside as what's been applied, especially for projects they do not have match. But if in excess of the 88 million count aside ha has been applied, we will go ahead and begin to award. Um, but we will not award. You know, we will still maintain that county set aside. That's what the round two is for, uh, in case some of the communities haven't tapped into that entire resource. And then we will issue a round two targeting those counties that haven't. And then if after that point there is still funding available then we will issue a round three. Okay, next question. Uh, Davis Bacon should not apply to the demolition since there's no reconstru reconstruction, correct? Correct. We we are having, um, I mentioned that the ORC citation for uh, state prevailing wage on these projects, and that will be the guidelines that need to be followed. Next question for the building and for the building demo and site revitalization program, is the county able to enter into an agreement with a lead entity outside of the county to administer the funds? For instance, if a county without a land bank wants to contract a neighboring county's land bank, is that allowed? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I don't. Let let me take that back and uh, let's let's research that one specifically and see if that is a, a workaround that we can can work through. We 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 will we definitely want each county representative. So we'll work with the county commissioners to determine who the best person is to be able to do that. So if that's something we need to look at in our system, we'll we'll make sure we do that. And if there is a county already where a county commission uh, a board of county commissioners are interested in doing that, please let us know. Um, and say, you know, we want to partner with this neighboring land bank for our county. That would be good too to, to know that. So that way we can clarify that and work with them. Next question. Uh, for match documentation, if you're using cash for a land bank, how do you document that? 
Um, if it's if if you're the source of the match, then just provide a, a, a letter certifying that you know this is the match that you will be providing, and then you uh, at each reimbursement you will have to um, you know demonstrate when that cash match is used. You'll have to provide documentation demonstrating that that match was used. And then a similar question was, uh, can dollars be spent for costs incurred prior to the grant agreement be counted as match? Yes. They they can up to uh, two years previously. Next question, does the EPA or a similar organization have to look over the application before being submitted for demolition? No. No. says, uh, for the demolition, wh when can a government apply and who do they apply with? What if the lead entity does not submit? So, uh, so the, if for the demolition program, oh, I, would, I was going to say for the demolition program, it does need to flow through that lead entity. So, um, in regard to who do you go with or, or how does that work? Um, you know, you, you would need to work with that lead entity and if it's not a land bank in that county, whoever the county commissioners um, utilize for that to run that program in that county, we are only going to have 88 green agreements with folks. Uh, so one for, for each county or the designee for each county. Next question, what if a demolition request also has a brownfield component? How do we link them? Many major commercial properties will have both. They, they need to apply for the brownfield program in that instance, because per, as part of the legislation, uh, you know, we're not able to put the demo money on a brownfield site. So the brownfield aspect needs to clean up, be cleaned up before a demolition grant can go into play. Right. With or do you have why do you, or why do you have such a short timeline to set up who is the lead by the twentieth of of this land bank of this month? Not all land banks are that organized and ready. Well, it, it, if it's a land bank, it's uh, you know they are the automatic designee, so that way and, and the form is very easy, straightforward. But we know that there is a. Um, large demand uh, out there, um, a lot of interest in the program. So we want to work with folks on the lead entity side where there is a, a land bank as well. If it's a land bank, you know, please go online. Like we said, we hope to have that form up and up and running today um, for the grant user access form um, and to go that route. Okay, I just had to scroll down quite a few. We've got a significant amount of questions here, uh, but I think this is the next one. What is acceptable as proof of access? Did we already have answer that one? I think that one's already. Yes, I think we tackled one. Okay, we we're assigning these, but we have 138 questions right now. So <laughs> I'm switching back over to all questions. Um, so if you could bear with me, I'll do this as quickly as possible. Sure. So I'm glad you guys are doing this, not me. <laughs> um, unless Greg, you are yeah, sure. able is, to do the next, next one. Is, is there a max award amount for the demolition program? No. Sorry, too short of an answer, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is, are vacant school buildings eligible for the demolition program? Yes, I don't see why that wouldn't hit yeah. as a eligible property. Another one queued up, uh, are Superfund designated sites eligible for phase two assessment funding? Yes. Yes. I don't, yes. Yeah, I don't see why those wouldn't be. Yep. 
it's my understanding, and th this gets to the guideline point where um, it ties to voluntary action program eligibility. It's my understanding that um, the Superfund sites are not actually eligible for the VAT program, which also helps free up some of our brownfield funding. So I don't see why they would be what, that why that we actually are looking to help those those types of entities get the that assessment funding covered. Okay, next question. Will any project that provides the required information in the application automatically be funded, or is there some discretion to be exercised as to whether a project is funded? Well, I would say that you know development does have discretion. I, I would I, I can't say whether a project will be or will not be funded just because it's also based on demand. So if you know we have seven hundred million dollars worth of ass in a month and a half, you know, I can't guarantee that that a project will be funded. I can say that you know we will consider them in, in the order that they are submitted. Um, more information, as, as you saw, kind of as Megan walk through the different screens to make sure that an entity, like a project, is eligible uh, for our, our program funding, and make it perfectly clear will help a, a long way through that determination. Okay. Covered that question. Um, match for the brownfield program is twenty five percent. What is the match percentage required for the Demo revitalization program. It it uh it mirrors that as well. It is up to seventy five. Uh, it how, we've we've actually kind of flipped it in there uh, in the guidelines, but it says twenty five percent of projects must be committed to the project. Uh, so the match goes into play after that first five hundred thousand for the demo has been utilized at the county level. Um, there is no match requirement for that for the each county set aside. But then we can only pay for up to 75% of a project cost uh, after that. The next question was, will the application for the demo program be open up for all participants at the same time or individually as you receive each participant's letter of intent or access form? And then follow up question, will review of the applications for the demo program take place for all applications at the same time, or will they all be conducted after February 25th or a rolling basis? So um, we, and that's why we're asking for that user agreement form, and then we will open up the application for everyone who has submitted those user agreement forms to us. So that's, so yes, they will all be opened up at the same time. You know, if we get your user agreement form tomorrow, we're not gonna open up the application to you until that December 22nd date. Um, and then, you know, as applications are received, our goal is to uh, close down those applications in February. And then at that point, we'll begin reviewing those applications. Then a follow up question was, when do you expect awards to be made and grantees be notified? After that period for the demolition program and then um, after uh, in February for the first round of the Brownfield program. Um, it says what's stopping multiple units of governments from submitting the same Brownfield project? I mean, there there is that potential. We'll have to, as we see the um, applications come in through our Salesforce application, um, you know, it'll be incumbent on us to to check and verify. I, I well, there's nothing stopping those different folks. I, I do hope there would be some sort of coordination to kind of collaborate together to apply. But we will uh, we'll have to see as the applications come in, kind of. You know, if there is multiple requests and things like that. Okay. It says, as a CIC managing the funds, is there any standard matrix that we should use to assess requests for funding? We are not looking to um, kind of dictate any type of local process or determination or anything like that. We want to allow folks um, at the at the local level to kind of 
submit those applications, determine what projects they would like to submit for if you are an entity that's able to apply. Um, and so, you know, we, we defer to you guys all on, on kind of what that process is because we don't want to kind of do a blanket statement that just doesn't work for you at the local level. Greg, I can, I, I was able to get this to stop starting at the beginning every time, so I can assist now. Oh. Uh, what, what protections are in place to ensure that historic resources, natural, national register listed buildings are protected? Um, you know, I think we'll have to get back with you on on that specific answer. Um, you know, we 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 coordinate with our historic preservation mm -hmm. office here, um, but we don't have a, a specific outlines at this point on on that process. The next question is: Which agency is going to be in charge of administering the Brownfield funds per county, the one million per county awards? There's not one specific agency. It's open to all eligible applicants. Okay, then I guess who's if multiple agencies apply, like who takes primacy? Um, so, as outlined in the guidelines, we uh, have to review the applications on a first come, first serve basis, and we will be looking at those counties that uh, submitted applications that do not have match um, and try to tag that towards the county set aside since it's not required for those. Um, and, but again, that's why we're encouraging that if you do have match to go ahead and include that in your application when you submit and to get those applications in as soon as you can. Do land banks have to own the property to utilize the demo funds? No, I think we outlined that specifically um, in that you have to um, demonstrate that you have access to the property. Mm -hmm. Which can be ownership, but is it necessarily an, an end all requirement? So to clarify, funds will be awarded by project, not like the US EPA Brownfield grants that are awarded to an entity to administer. Correct. Brownfield is not going to one entity alone per county. For the Brownfield program, where will the project be listed once identified to receive a grant? We'll notify the um, the entity uh, that they will be uh, awarded a, a grant. Uh, what is the trigger date for the two year look back for match? Is it the date of submittal or is it date of program launch or what is it? Um, the date of submission of the application. Is there a performance period set out for both projects? Um, oh, you asked me too quick. I think we have that outlined until 2023. Yes, so for demo, we have that we would like to have things closed out. Uh, final project report due December 31st, 2023. Okay, um, we have a repeat questions here. Uh, is there a performance period set out for both projects? Oh, I think, I think we just covered that 1. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> Next question was, uh, does the grant user access individual need to be directly associated 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 with the land bank? such as an executive director, or it can be an individual or county staff, such as the planning manager or similar. Yeah, that, that's fine. As long as, you know, if the, if the county planner is working with the land bank to submit the application, we will set them up as um, have access in the system, but we just need to get that, that form from the lead entity itself so that we know that who, who has needs to have access to, to submit on their behalf. For each program, how soon after application submittal will ODOD announce awards? 
So you'll receive notification that your application was successfully submitted. Um, and then, you know, for Brownfield, we plan to close down the first round there at the end of January and make awards after that point. Uh, Demolition we plan to close down at the end of February and make awards after that point. Uh, the term project in a demo project program suggests a site. In the case of residential, it may be numerous sites in several neighborhoods. How do you want to see this organized in the application? So within the application for demolition, there uh, is a scope of work essentially that you will fill out that locates, that provides the location of the project by the address. Um, so you will include the project location, the type of project it is, when you plan to do construction. Um, and then within the application itself, you can, um, you'll also include the cost of that specific project and that location. And then you can add multiple scopes of work as, as many as you want. So then you will add in all the different locations if you're doing residential properties throughout the community. Regarding residential and commercial non-brownfield properties, will you require one application per address? This land bank anticipates undertaking more than 1,000 demolitions and has matching funds, matching funds commitments. Wow, great. Um, so basically same answer as I provided before. So you have one application, right? Where you'll provide all the general general information and then you'll provide a specific information on all the different properties that you plan to do demolition activities on. Uh, does the property need to be owned by the political subdivision that applies for it? So it, it does not, but you do need to demonstrate that you have the uh, you have the legal authority to have that access. So that that's kind of where that access point comes in. Ownership straightforward, but then if it's not ownership, like you need to provide that that documentation to demonstrate that you have the ability to go in and do the site cleanup and, and things of that nature. The Brownfield program are past expenses eligible for a project that is in process. Example, if we have spent 1 million and need to spend another 1 million, can we ask for 2 million for cleanup? Not for cost cannot be incurred for this program outside of the uh, award period, which will be um, after your applications are submitted and approved. So if you have costs incurred prior to that, they will not be reimbursable to this program but they could count for a match component. So Correct. you'd have that match component that you could demonstrate. For the demo program, will this be similar to the NIP program and that these funds can be used to cover greening, tree removal, sidewalks, et cetera? Um, I'm not sure on the specifics on that program and, um, you know, there, there is some post demolition costs that are eligible, which include like site restoration, so grading, seeding, things like that. Um, so yes, those are are allowable costs for the demolition side of the program. Mm -hmm. If a brownfield property is ineligible for the VAP for some reason, is a project still potentially eligible for the DOD brownfield remediation fund? So, if a VAP CNS is not a possibility, would the project not be eligible for this fund? So, for those projects, I would say go ahead and submit an application and, and we'll take a look at that and, and work with our folks at the EPA and, and determine if it would still be eligible for these resources. Uh, can acquisition costs be included as part of the application? Yes, up to a certain percent. I believe it's 10% of the, yeah. Maximum 10% of the total requests. And also we don't want to exceed the acquisition, the, the acquisition cost can't exceed the county auditor property value. What restrictions, if any, will be put on private owners of brownfields who have not contributed to environmental issues? Mm -hmm. 
not sure I 100% understand the, <laughs> the question on that front, um, but uh, those who contributed to the contamination are not eligible um, applicants or partners on the project. Uh, can you elaborate on the Brownfield program round two funding? You indicated if needed. So does this mean round two will only focus on county set asides? Correct. Yes. So round two is specifically out there. If there are communities that do not apply for that full 1 million that's been set aside within the first round. Can a county apply for two properties to demo with one application if it's within the $500,000 allocation? Yep, uh, a county, uh, again, you can, um, you will submit one application per county and there can be multiple scopes of work within that application that out outline multiple properties. And I will note we have about four minutes left on on my clock here. So, and I realize there are nearly 200 questions and I think we've tackled quite a few, but I don't think we've got through all of them. So uh, I will anticipate us providing responses after today's discussion. But we can tackle a few more guys. So, uh, it says, if a brownfield property has known asbestos that needs to be remediated prior to renovation activities, but also has lead paint contamination that is present in the same place, can the Brownfield Remediation Grant pay for lead-based paint cleanup too? Uh, currently, uh, and I'm currently we have outlined for asbestos costs only um, on sites that again, where, you know, you're tackling that to get to the subsurface issues. Um, so we, you know, we can take a look at the application and determine that we also, if those costs are utilized other funding sources that can be used for for to count towards match as well. Is it a drawdown based program? How do we get the funds? It is, it is a, a reimbursement program. Um, so the reimbursement process is an online process. So after you are approved, have your grant agreement with us, you can submit draw requests um, against your budget. You'll provide some documentation supporting those and then it is an electronic transfer of funds. Uh, is confirmatory sampling for a cleanup an eligible expense under the Brownfield program? I'll need to double check what we have outlined in the budget. I believe it is, but we'll double check that. Can for profit entities apply on their own or do they need to have city county partnership? You do need to demonstrate a partner partnership with your units of local government, but you can apply directly. What would cause the board to deny a project? Uh, there isn't a, a board for okay. this one. Or what would cause development to deny a project? Um, so again, we're gonna look at projects on a first come first serve basis. We're gonna make sure those applications are complete and if there's any information missing or that we need to clarify, the entity that is applying will have an opportunity to uh, provide that missing information. And I think we'll maybe take one more. Okay, let me see here. For the demo program, will the specific properties need to be identified in the application or can those be identified after award? They will need, you need to have the properties identified in the application. Then one real quick one. What what time will the application be open on December thirteenth? Um, so right now we're we're targeting the week of December thirteenth. Um, I don't have a specific time yet, uh, and I kind of like this one. Best laid plans. You know the the servers went down. And we weren't able to launch this one <laughs> when we wanted to last week. So the goal is is next week, and we will notify folks when it's open. Yeah, and, and we've. As we've talked to people, we've tried to make sure that we kept track of folks. So, to, um, you know, 
create like stakeholder emails, things like that. People can reach out to us too. We do hope to send out and, and let folks know uh, when these applications and, and things come online over the next couple of weeks. Um, so that way folks can get into the system, get the IID, get that prepared and, and go from there. Kind of what we've done in the past, if, if some of you were involved at all with the water and wastewater program that we've recently launched, our, our plan now is to take this um, for some folks that have hopped on later. Yes, the, the, this is being recorded. It will be eventually provided on the website. This slideshow will also be available and presented. We also will create, it, it will take us a little bit of time just with the volume of questions, but also work on creating an FAQ where we tie a lot of these things in based on the questions that you all have had. Put that uh, together, post that up as well. Um, so that way folks can have an opportunity to kind of see some of these questions and answers and the ones that we didn't get to, some sort of resolution to those as well. I greatly appreciate everyone's interest in this for, for participating. I hope we were able to answer some of those questions that were out there. I'm sorry that in the time allotted, we weren't able to answer all of them, but we do want to get these clarifying uh, thoughts and, and qualifiers out there for folks so that way everyone has a very successful application we're excited about it and i hope you are too so thank you very much for taking the time to join us today for this webinar and we look forward to staying in touch thank you all bye take care